Yo, what's good? We're back with the War of Art. We're into the last part of the book. We're starting with a quote from Xenophon. The Cavalry Commander. The first duty is to sacrifice to the gods and pray them to grant you the thoughts, words, and deeds likely to render your command most pleasing to the gods and to bring yourself, your friends, and your city the fullest measure of affection and glory and advantage. Angels in the Abstract. The next few chapters are going to be about those invisible psychic forces that support and sustain us in our journey toward ourselves. I plan on using terms like muses and angels. Does that make you uncomfortable? If it does, do you have permission to think of angels in the abstract? Consider these forces as being impersonal as gravity. Maybe they are. It's not hard to believe, it's not that hard to believe, is it? That a force exists. Alright, this part's just crap, essentially talking about whether or not you can or cannot refer to angels. Stuff it. I'm Catholic, I like angels. <laughs> Approaching the mystery. Why have I stressed professionalism so heavily in the preceding chapters? Because the most important thing about art is to work. Nothing else matters except sitting down every day and trying. Why is it so important? Because when we sit down day after day and keep grinding, something mysterious starts to happen. A process is set into motion by which, inevitably and infallibly, heaven comes to our aid. Unseen forces enlist in our cause. Serendipity reinforces our purpose. This is the other secret that real artists know and wannabe writers don't. When we sit down each day and do our work, power concentrates around us. The muse takes note of our dedication. She approves. We have earned favor in her sight. When we sit down and work, we become like a magnetized rod that attracts iron filings. Ideas come. Insights accrete. Just as resistance has its seat in hell, so creation has its home in heaven. And it's not just a witness, but an eager and active ally. What I call professionalism, someone else might call the artist's code or the warrior's way. It's an attitude of egolessness and service. The knights of the round table were chaste and self-effacing, yet they jeweled dragons. We're facing dragons too, fire-breathing griffin, griffins of the soul, whom we must outfight and outwit to reach the treasure of our self in potential, and to realize the maiden who is God's plan and destiny for ourselves, and the answer to why we were put on this planet. Invoking the Muse The quote from Xenophon that opens this section comes from a pamphlet called The Cavalry Commander, in which the celebrated warrior and historian proffers instructions to those young gentlemen who aspire to be officers of the Athenian equestrian cause. He declares that the commander's first duty, before he mucks out a stable or seeks funding from the Defense Review Board, is to sacrifice to the gods and invoke their aid. I do the same thing. The last thing I do before I sit down to work is say my prayer to the muse. I say it out loud, in absolute earnest. Only then do I get down to business. I'm just going to cut away a little bit here. He always talks about making his prayer to the muse rather than making a prayer to some, you know, rando force that's not your own religious view if, if you do have one. It's about setting up, setting up things that you do all the time to reinforce your, in your brain that it's work time at the moment. Whether that's a prayer to God asking for creativity, don't just sort of make it a waste of time. If it's make it something that benefits you, that builds you. In my late twenties, I rented a little house in Northern California. I had gone there to finish a novel or kill myself trying. By that time, I had blown up a marriage to a girl I loved with all my heart. Screwed up two careers, blah blah, etc. All because I had no understanding of, of this at the time. I could not handle resistance. I had one novel, nine tenths of the way through, and another at ninety-nine hundredths before I threw them in the trash. I couldn't finish him. I didn't have the guts. In yielding thusly to resistance, I fell prey to every vice, evil, distraction, you name it mentioned before, all leading nowhere. And finally, washed up in this sleepy California town with my Chevy van, my cat Mo, and my antique Smith Corona. 
A guy named Paul Rink lived down the street. Look him up. He's in Henry Miller's Big Sur and the Oranges of well, Hieronymus Bosch. Paul was a writer. He lived in his camper, Moby Dick. I started each day over coffee with Paul. He turned me on to all kinds of authors I had never heard of, lectured me on self-discipline, dedicated the evils of the marketplace. But best of all, he shared with me his prayer, the invocations of the muse from Homer's Odyssey, the T.E. Lawrence translation. Paul typed it out for me on his, even more ancient than mine, Manuel Remington. I still have it. It's yellow and parched as dust. The merest puff would blow it to powder. In my little house I had no TV. I never read a newspaper or went to a movie. I just worked. One afternoon I was banging away in the little bathroom I had converted to an office when I heard my neighbor's radio playing outside. Someone in a loud voice was declaiming to preserve, protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. I came out. What's going on? Didn't you hear? Nixon's out. They got a new guy in there. I had missed Watergate completely. I was determined to keep working. I'd failed so many times and caused myself and people I loved so much pain. Thereby that I felt if I crapped out this time, I would have, I would have to hang myself. I didn't know what resistance was then. No one had schooled me in the concept. I felt it though, big time. I experienced it as a compulsion to self-destruct. I could not finish what I started. The closer I got, the more different ways I'd find to screw it up. I worked for 26 months straight, taking out only for a stint of migrant labor in the Washington state. And finally, one day, I got to the last page and typed out the end. I never did find a buyer for that book or the next one either. It was 10 years before I got the first check for something I had written and 10 more before a novel, The Legend of Bag of Ends, was actually published. But that moment when I first hit the keys to spell out the end was a pokal. I remember rolling the last page out and adding it to the stack. That was, sorry, that was the finished manuscript. Nobody knew I was done. Nobody cared. But I knew it. I felt like a dragon I'd been fighting my whole life had just dropped dead at my feet and gasped out its last sulfuric breath. Rest in peace, motherfucker. Next morning, I went over to Paul's for coffee and told him I had finished. Good for you, he said without looking up. Start the next one today. Invoking the Muse Part 2 Before I met Paul, I had never heard of the Muses. He enlightened me. The Muses were nine sisters, daughters of Zeus, Menesani, which means memory. Zeus and, Zeus and Menesani, sorry, which means memory. Their names are Cleo, Areto, Talia, Therpsichore, Calliope, Polyhemia, Euterpe, Mel... Greek names, I'm sorry, <laughs> Melpomene and Urania. Their job is to inspire artists. Each muse is responsible for a different art. There's a neighborhood in New Orleans where the streets are named after the muses. I lived there once and had no idea. I thought they were just weird names. Here's Socrates in Plato's Phaedrus on the noble effect of heaven-sent madness. The third type of possession and madness is possession by the muses. When this seizes upon the gentle and virgin soul, it rouses it to inspired expression in lyric and other sorts of poetry and glorifies countless deeds of the heroes of old for the instruction of posterity. But if a man comes to the door of poetry, untouched by the madness of the muses, believing that technique alone will make him a good poet, he and his sane compositions never reach perfection, but are utterly eclipsed by the performances of the, un of the inspired madman. The, uh, the Greek way of apprehending the mystery was to personify it. The ancients sent the ancients sensed powerful primordial forces in the world. To make them approachable, they gave them human faces. They called them Zeus, Apollo, Aphrodite. American Indians felt the same way, but rendered it in animalistic forms. Bear teacher, hawk messenger, coyote, stri coyote trickster. Our ancestors were keenly cognizant of forces and energies whose seat was not in this material sphere, but in a loftier, more mysterious one. What did they believe about this higher reality? 
First, they believed that death did not exist there. The gods are immortal. The gods, though, not unlike humans, are infinitely more powerful. To defy their will is futile. To act toward heaven with pride is to call down calamity. Time and space display an altered existence in this higher dimension. The gods travel swift as thought. They can tell the future, some of them. And though the playwright, Agathon, tells us, this alone is denied to God, the power to undo the past. Yet, the immortals can play tricks with time, as we ourselves may sometimes in as we ourselves may sometimes in dreams or visions. The universe, the Greeks believed, was not indifferent. The gods take an interest in human affairs and intercede for good or ill in our designs. The contemporary view is that all this is charming, but preposterous. Is it? Then answer this. Where did Hamlet come from? Where did Parthenon come from? Where did nude descending a staircase come from? Testament of a Visionary Eternity is in love with the creations of time, William Blake. The visionary poet William Blake was, so I understand, one of those half-mad avatars who appear in flesh from time to time, servants capable of ascending for brief periods loft to loftier planes and returning to share their, the wonders they have seen. Shall we try to decipher the meaning of the verse above? What Blake means by eternity, I think, is a sphere higher than this one, a plane of reality superior to the material dimension in which we dwell. In eternity, there is no such thing as time, or Blake's syntax wouldn't distinguish it from eternity, and probably no space either. This plane may be in inhabited by higher creatures, or it may be pure consciousness or spirit, but whatever it is, according to Blake, it's capable of being in love. If beings inhabit this plane, I take Blake to mean that they are incorporeal, they don't have bodies, but they have a connection to the sphere of time, the one we live in. Those gods or spirits participate in this dimension, they take an interest in it. Eternity is in love with the creations of time, means to me that in some way these creatures of the higher sphere, or the sphere itself in the abstract, take joy in what we time-bound beings can bring forth into physical existence in our limited material sphere. It may be pushing the envelope, but if these beings take joy in the creations of time, might they not also nudge us a little to produce them? If that's true, then the image of the muse whispering inspiration in the artist's ear is quite apt. The timeless communication to the time bound. By Blake's model, as I understand it, it's as though the fifth symphony existed already in that higher sphere, before Beethoven sat down and played da-da-da-dum. The catch was this, the work only existed as potential, without a body so to speak. It wasn't music yet. You couldn't play it, you couldn't hear it. It needed someone. It needed a corporeal being, a human, an artist, or more precisely a genius in the Latin sense of soul and animating spirit, to bring it into being on this material plane. So the muse whispered into Beethoven's ear. Maybe she hummed a few bars into a million other ears, but no one else heard her. Only Beethoven got it. He brought it forth. He made the Fifth Symphony, a creation of time, which eternity could be in love with, so that eternity, whether we conceive of it as God, pure consciousness, infinite intelligence, omniscient spirit, or if we choose not to think of it as beings, gods, spirits, or avatars, when it or they hear somehow the sounds of earthly music, it brings them joy. In other words, Blake agrees with the Greeks. The gods do exist. They do penetrate our earthly sphere. Okay, I'm going to stop it there because I'm not sure if my camera is recording. If it is, we're going to have an awkward part at the end of this. It's saying it's connected now. Okay, we are recording apparently, so I'm going to have to get up and stop it at the end of this, I apologize. Um, in other words, Blake agrees with the Greeks, the gods do exist, they do penetrate our earthly sphere, which brings us back to the muse. The muse, remember, is the daughter of Zeus, father of the gods and memory, Menesene. That's a pretty impressive pedigree, I'll accept those credentials. 
I'll take Xenophon at his word before I sit down to work. I'll take a minute and show respect to this unseen power who can make or break me.